Maps. So I'm Amy Emerson, and uh, I work in the clinical operations group at MAPS, and I have spent a lot of years in industry working in clinical research. So, and uh, Michelle and I have worked together before at uh, other at a pharmaceutical company, and uh, so we decided to come together today to talk a little bit about the regulations around doing clinical research. So we talked about a lot of very interesting research that's being done, and we're not going to talk about any specific results or any specific studies, but the requirements of what it takes to do those studies when you're doing a human clinical study that's going to be used as part of a new drug application. <coughs> uh, you can change the slide. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the framework of doing these clinical, this clinical research in human studies and that if you decide to be an investigator in one of these studies, what are the responsibilities that you're taking on? And then uh, Michelle, in the second half of the talk, is going to talk about a little of when the FDA comes to uh, inspect the studies that are done for a new drug application, what kind of findings that they have, and so that we can try and learn from these lessons and do a better job at the research that we're doing by learning from other people's mistakes. <laughs> So there's been all kinds of discussions about all kinds of research projects. Some of them are preclinical research. Some of them are clinical research with, with subjects. And there's many different directions that this research takes. And one of the things I think in common with all of the research that we're talking about is that we want to get these drugs approved to help people that are suffering. And so. In order to do this, we have to do our trials, our human trials, within a certain framework so that the data can be used to support the approval of these drugs. And the first step in doing a human clinical study, if you're going to work in the US, is to do an IND. This is an investigational new drug application. And when you do the IND, the FDA takes it, reviews it, and approves it for a certain drug. And then all the protocols that you do, all of the studies that you do, get submitted to this IND. And hopefully, what you end up with in the end, after a very long process that can take 10, 20 years, depending on, uh, on the path that you take, um, you end up with a new drug application. And hopefully, you end up with it approved so that you have a drug that can be used in a, in a legal way for a specific indication, OK? <laughs> So uh, let's see. So there's other reasons. So we're talking mostly about a new drug application. Why do you do a study under IND? And uh, we're doing uh, most of this study so that we can get these drugs approved for the first time. And this is the new drug application. But there's other reasons to do studies under IND if you already have a drug that's approved, um, but you want to change the indication that the drug is used for. You want to change the route of administration or the dosage that it's used in or the population of people that it's going to go into. You still have to do studies under an IND and go through the process again. It's a little bit easier if you already have an approved drug and you're just changing some of these things. <coughs> Um, so the requirements of doing a study under an IND are first, like I said, to submit your, um, your investigational new drug application to the FDA. Um, and then you're going to also get approval for any protocol that you do through an institutional review board or an ethics committee. Um, these can be associated with a specific institution that you're working with, or they can be a general ethics committee, but every protocol has to be approved and all of the study documentation that would go to the subjects would go through this also. Um, you have to conduct all of your studies under good clinical practices, which we call GCPs, and in the US under the FDA Code of Federal Regulations. Um, when you're doing 
these studies under IND. You might have multiple protocols going or maybe one, it doesn't matter, but every year you send a um, progress report to the FDA and it summarizes the studies that you have or that are ongoing or that are ended and what the data and what some of the safety is on those studies. And then also when you're doing a study under an IND, you're opening yourself up to the possibility that the FDA may come and inspect your study site and your data. <clears throat> so what are the good clinical practices? Good clinical practices are this framework of rules, regulations, and they're all available online. I'm not going to start reading the GCP to you, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about why it's there. It's there to ensure the rights and safety and confidentiality of any person that decides to participate in a clinical study. And it's also there to help ensure that we have good quality data, that it's credible and accurate when you're using it for the application. And then it also, these GCPs help you when you're designing your study and conducting your study to make sure that you're doing it in a consistent way and that the data is recorded in a specific way that it's analyzed consistently and then reported back to the agency that you're working with in a consistent way. So these GCP um, standards, you do them for any clinical study, whether you're working in the US or not, but um, so they are part of this framework and within that also you have the Code of Federal Regulations and in the US we specifically talk about part 21 of the CFR. And these are all online, and if you're going to do a clinical study, you have to be familiar with them. But again, I'm not going to read to you about the CFR because you can find all of that information online um, at, at clinicalfda.gov. It's all over. Just put in CFR, you'll find it. Um, and then every country that you would work in also has their own set of guidelines. So if you're working in Canada, they have a set. If you're working in the EU, they have the EMEA. Every place you work has their own set of guidelines. And there's also this ICH guidelines. And these were developed for international studies to help facilitate this mutual acceptance of clinical data. Because if you're doing international studies, you might be trying to go for an approval more than just in the US or in Canada. You may want to be, get your drug approved in multiple countries. So these guidelines try to help you make sure that the, dis, the, the data would be accepted over multiple countries. So they. There, all these rules and guidelines are, for, are you know, providing you a framework of, to know how to do these studies so that the data can be accepted. All right, so who are the key players when you're doing a clinical study? Well, the sponsor, if you're, if you're being sponsored, if the money is coming from um, outside, so outside of, uh, of the investigator, in a, or if there's a company that's providing the investigational product or the drug, then this is the sponsor. And then you have the investigator and their site team and staff. You have the regulatory authority that you're working under, and you have the subject or the participant that's going to be in your clinical study. And there's responsibilities that all of these various players share within being in a clinical study. So as a sponsor and a site, we should be Doing, we should be having well-planned studies, right? You want a soundly written protocol, one that can be followed, and one that collects accurate, reproducible data. When you're writing and designing a study, you want to make sure that you've taken into account the risks and the benefits for the population that's going to be in the study, and you want a good balance of those things. You're going to be working with ethics committees to ensure that they are approving the protocol, any information that's going to the subject, and, um, and that there's an informed consent process in place that's approved. Um, there's also um, a responsibility to be informed, and this is sh shared by everybody, including the participant. We have a, a, a responsibility to inform them about the clinical trial, but they also have a responsibility to be informed about what they're participating in. Uh, there's training that happens, and there's training that happens from either the sponsor, that if they're sponsoring the study, there's the site, and that's doing the study and that they have to train their staff. And the patients also have to be trained of what's expected of them in the protocol that they're going to participate in. Um, there's monitoring that happens. So there's monitoring that maybe the sponsor sends out, monitors to review the data. But then there's internal monitoring that the sites do. So there's, there's a, you're getting the feeling there's a lot of paperwork involved with all of this. And it's true, there is. Um, it's also a responsibility for us all to work with qualified people that are trained to do these studies appropriately. 
there's a lot of money that is spent in doing these clinical trials, and, and you want that money to be well spent to collect good data. Okay, so now let's say you're already involved in the clinical research and uh, you've been going on and following all these GCPs. And if you're doing the study under IND or if you're doing it in other countries under another regulatory agency, you are opening yourself up to being inspected by that agency. And here's a few of the things that um, might happen if somebody, if you come to be inspected, if the FDA knocks on your door. They're going to look at the source of the study subjects. They're going to say, where did you uh, recruit from and how did you recruit? They're going to make sure that they understand your informed consent process. They want to see the informed consent that you use, make sure it's approved, and they want to understand who did that informed consenting process. So they might ask you to lead them through it. Um, they're going to look to make sure that you um, complied with the protocol design um, and that if tasks were delegated to other people at your study site that you had that documented to make sure that those people were qualified and trained to do it and that the investigator maintained responsibility over the whole study. They're going to look at your source records, so the medical records, compared to the case report forms, which are the data collection forms that are then usually collected and the data is entered off of them to analyze the data. And they're going to make sure that there was appropriate reporting of all adverse events, serious adverse events, and that you had ongoing IRB approval. So some of the most common findings that happen when the FDA comes in are that there was failures to, so these are all in order of the most common to the least common. The most common is that there was, the protocol wasn't adhered to um, exactly as it was written. So maybe items were omitted for, um, uh, that you were supposed to do a certain test and it wasn't done or it wasn't done within the right timing, okay, or there was dosing errors. So anything that, that didn't adhere exactly to what was written in the protocol. Um, another very common one, and that's very serious, is informed consent issues. So either an informed consent was done improperly or the wrong form was used, it wasn't an approved form. Uh, and then inclusion-exclusion criteria. So maybe you enrolled somebody in the study that didn't really meet the inclusion criteria or you couldn't um, su give supporting documentation to show that they met the inclusion-exclusion. So you didn't have the proper medical records to show the auditor. Um, lapses in IRB approvals and in reporting. Uh, let's see. So uh, failure to maintain adequate, accurate case history. So this is, again, just going back to the source records and the documentation of the people that are in the studies. Another important one is um, documenting the drug accountability. Um, and so they want to make sure that this drug is controlled well and that you know exactly what went in and out, uh, that the investigator keeps responsibility over the study at all times, and that people are trained and that records are retained. So now I'm going to hand it over to Michelle, and she's going to talk about some specific findings um, that are always kind of fun to hear about when they're not your findings. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Amy. So um, my name is Michelle Lloyds, and as Amy said, we worked together actually a couple of times, um, first at Chiron and later again when Chiron became Novartis. My background is in clinical operations training and quality assurance. So I, um, I've been consulting for uh, about a year, which has afforded me the opportunity to, to work with Max. I'm absolutely thrilled about that. So my part of the talk is called Truth or Consequences. Um, I want to tell you, I'm not old enough to remember this show, but I, I, I vaguely remember hearing about it, but, um, but I liked the title because when we conduct clinical trials, we do have some fundamental truths, which are the regulations that we absolutely must adhere to. And in the United States, as you'll see a few slides later, if you seriously violate these regulations, it's actually punishable by law. So it's some serious stuff. And obviously those are your consequences, your repercussions for not being compliant. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about something called the Statement of Investigator. And when you decide to conduct a clinical trial, you do so, as Amy was saying before, with the understanding that you're going to have a copious amount of documentation to complete. In the QA business and in the monitoring business, one of our favorite mantras is, if it wasn't documented, it wasn't done. And what we want to be able to do at the end of the day when we've conducted a clinical trial is have 
inscrutable evidence.